thank you all so much for joining us for Hidden Treasures of Boston, Things to Do in and Around the City. And today we're looking at premium venues around Boston. So last month, um, we uh, looked at free and cheap things to do. So if you catch my drift, this, this month we're looking at premium things to do in and around the city. Uh, so we're going to get an inside look at some of Boston's hidden treasures from popular Boston tour guide Jay Bazinotti, a corporal in the 1st New Hampshire Regiment of Revolutionary War reenactors. Jay will appear in uniform to talk about some of the little known landmarks, or in, uh, some of these will be known uh, landmarks uh, and monuments in the Boston area. Uh, much of the city's rich and fascinating history is invisible, not just to the casual uh, visitor, but also to those who have uh, lived here all their lives. And again, I want to thank the uh, the Ashland Library, as well as the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring and promoting today's program. So uh, all uh, 50 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jay for joining us here this morning. And Jay, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. This is part six of a seven part series. This is premium venues around Boston. Again, my name is Jay Bazinotti. I've been giving official and unofficial tours of Boston for about 30 years as, as a hobby. And uh, as you can see, I'm also a member of the 1st New Hampshire Regiment of Reenactors. The 1st New Hampshire was the first unit to be inducted into the United States Army outside Boston. And if you go to the Public Garden and you see the George Ball statue of George Washington, that is to commemorate him dismissing the United States Army at the end of the Revolutionary War, which he did from the Boston Common. And the 1st New Hampshire Regiment was the last regiment to leave the United States Army. So just as a point of trivia, the four oldest regiments still existing in the United States Army are, the, are from Boston. They were originally called West, South, East and North, and they guarded Boston from attacks by the Indians. Those are the only regiments that are allowed, or divisions that are allowed to carry flags from Lexington and Concord. So the presentation is broken up into two parts. The first part are cool things from Boston, things that happened in and around Boston. And the second part will be the actual venues that I've found that I like. I don't wanna claim that I know everything. Not everything is here. There are probably lots of things that you know that I don't know. And if you have something that you like that you would like me to add, please send it in the chat or text box and I'll be happy to put it into future presentations. So that being said, I'm going to move along to the next slide, which now is not working. Oh, there it is. Yay. Cool things from around Boston. Okay, United States. Uh, the first waterworks in the United States was here in Boston. It was put in as a uh, uh, irrigation system. And uh, it was put in, flowed by gravity. As you can see, this is some of the, 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 uh, the logs that were used. They were hollowed out with a giant ship auger and cut into cones on the end and then fit into each other. And this is where we get the word fire plug for fire hydrant, because what would happen is if there was a fire and there was a pipe nearby, they would dig down to it and drill a hole in it and then put their little garden hose in there, suck up the water from a hand pump, which went into like a child's wagon. And by the way, the first fire engine, 1793, is still visible at the Boston Fire Museum. And then they would use their garden hose to put to try to put the fire out. In those days, putting out fire was a matter of saving people, not property. So everyone pretty much knew the house was going to go down when the fire started. The idea was to get the people and any possessions out of the house as quickly as possible. And that's where we get the expression, by the way, by hook or by crook. The oldest legal aid organization in America on Park Street in Boston um, started by John Adams. This provides pro bono support for anybody who comes in. 13,000 members, not just here, but all around the country. They are a high profile legal, legal organization that has direct access to the Supreme Court. Now, as you may recall that during the Boston massacre, um, it was John Adams who defended the British soldiers who shot the colonists. Now, uh, if they had been found guilty, they would have had their thumbs cut off or they would have been branded, but they were not found guilty. So um, many British soldiers are buried in the uh, burial ground at the public, at the uh, Boston Common, where Gilbert Stewart is also buried. First house in America with indoor plumbing. 
We take this a lot for granted, but 1819 having indoor plumbing was an incredible technological advance. Now, it's interesting to point out that in 1850 in Natchez, Mississippi, there was a house that used a windmill to propel water to a cistern so they could have a flush toilet. And that was in 1850. And it wasn't until 1875 that only 1500 houses in all of New York actually had plumbing. The introduction of ducted pipe uh, came about in 1825 and ducted pipe was what made mass plumbing possible. In this particular case, uh, the guy had a hand pump with a uh, um, latrine system in the basement. Latrine systems were very common in Boston and in all cities. And in fact, until 1940, there were still 100,000 public outhouses in New York City alone. And those things had to be shoveled out. So um, it was having indoor plumbing was a pretty incredible thing. You can see that this house on Beacon Street sold for over $12 million recently. Um, all the houses on Beacon Street are in the tens of millions of dollars and you have to be rich to live there. First mass production of candy, 1847. As it turns out, uh, chocolate and sugar were big revolutionary things that came from Boston. Um, sugar was refined in Boston, in East Boston. In fact, granulated sugar was first created in Boston and is patented in East Boston at the American Sugar Refinery. And the American, American Sugar Refinery was the first company to be broken up by the antitrust rules in the 1890s. So as you can see that the Necco company was the company that made these little candies, right? And they were, uh, they were the largest candy maker in the entire world for a little while, but the family mismanaged the company into bankruptcy, although they were able to struggle along and they finally collapsed a couple of years ago. Now the Necco factory is still around in Cambridge, but now it's uh, offices, I believe uh, Biogen, I think or one of the pharma companies owns the property. And I think it still says Necco on the stacks. This is a really interesting story. The first Harbor Patrol in America. So America was a big Harbor and uh, we had a flourishing piracy problem. You know, we had the first police department in America in 1835 established after the Peelian rules of policing established in England by Sir Robert Peel, but they did not touch the harbor. They only worked within the city. And in fact, they only had about 12 guys working in the police department. So they couldn't go near the docks anyway, which were a pretty horrible and dangerous place. So it turns out that pirates would come into the harbor on rowboats, climb up onto the boats in the dark, clonk the security guard over the head and sail the boat out of the city. So this was actually a pretty bad situation. So Boston invented the first Boston Harbor Patrol and they wiped out with that entire thievery ring within a very short time. And it was so popular and so successful that other cities all around the country came to Boston to learn how to put in a Harbor Patrol. Today, the Boston Harbor Patrol has 28 boats including an 80-foot minesweeper, which has been converted for drug interdiction use. They also have a dive team, and they are constantly checking under the water for people who throw guns and things into the water. And things you never thought you would see again after you throw them in the water, they bring up all the time. As it happens, I had a cousin who was one of those divers for a while. So Boston has nearly 30 islands, so the police are constantly patrolling the harbor and the islands to make sure everybody's okay. The jelly bean, the, the nice jelly bean that everybody loves so much was invented here by William Schraff. Now you can still see the Schraff building, but it's condominiums. As you go down 93 over the Leonard Zakem Bridge, on the right-hand side is the Schraff building. When I was growing up, everybody had Schraff chocolates. They were for sale everywhere, Woolworths and all the stores, but then Schraff went away. Um, jelly beans became famous in 1901 and then became associated with Easter because of their egg-like shape in 1930. So that massive factory that was in Sullivan Square, it turns out that Boston for a little time was the chocolate and candy capital of America. That didn't last very long, but there were still lots of remnants of what, Amer what Boston was, like the Walter Baker Chocolate Factory and Schraff's and other places that, that made them. So they sponsored the first telecast of Wizard of Oz in 1960, 
And they even used Andy Warhol to make their commercials. They went out of business in 1980. That office complex is still there, the Schraffs building, and it still says Schraffs on it, which I think is really cool. This is pretty interesting. The first female gynecologist of the United States, uh, Dr. Mary Jane Safford Blake. She started in the Union Army and worked for Ulysses S. Grant at the Battle of Shiloh, who had nothing but good things to say about her. Um, she, despite a lot of prejudice against her, she did graduate from medical college. She went to Europe to hone her skills. And the interesting thing about this is that when she came back, she shocked the male gynecologists with her understanding of the mysteries of the female anatomy, which must have been pretty amazing back then um, to have a woman actually working for women or working on women. This, by the way, 1872 was a time of massive change for women. And the big things that changed right around this time were the introduction of the popularity of the bicycle, which gave women independence from the horse and buggy and the menstrual pad, which was invented in Germany by the Paul Hartman Company. And this gave women for the first time the freedom to move about as an independent being separate from their families. The wooden golf tee was invented here in Boston in 1899. Um, in fact, until then, people just used to carry around a tee box, which is why we call it a tee, filled up with sand, which they would pile on the ground and then hit the ball off the sand. So uh, golf came to America in 1888. A Harvard professor named Dr. Grant invented the wooden golf tee, and there have been no changes to the game of golf as far as the rules are concerned since this introduction of the wooden tee, which came here from Boston. Yay. So the oldest continuously operating theater in America is 1900. It's certainly not the first theater. The first theater actually took place at the, the Three Grapes Tavern in Boston back in the 1600s. But theater back in those days was considered very sinful and actors were considered immoral people. However, over time, obviously things changed, but the oldest existing th theater is this colonial theater in Boston on Boylston Street, right across from the common. In fact, you can walk right by it with barely knowing it was there. That was the Boston Public Library at one time and the theater was built inside it. Now, the interesting thing about this, and I was there when this happened actually, was that the building was bought by Emerson College after the theater went bankrupt in 2003. And they were gonna clean it all out and make it into a dining hall in dormitories. However, there was such an enormous outcry against this event that the theater has been preserved, still owned by Emerson College, but it is still there for productions. Oops, I'm sorry. Now, this one is a, a really interesting thing. I th when I think about all the cool things that come from Boston, this has to be close to the top of the list, although I think toilet paper was probably the most important thing that came from Boston, invented by Joseph Gady in 1858. But bituminous asphalt changed the entire world. Asphalt was first discovered in 650 BC in Babylon, and over the years, it had been used for various things. For example, Sir Francis Drake used the asphalt in Trinidad to paint his ships over to make them waterproof. And um, a man named McAdam in Scotland used natural asphalt to, to pave 900 miles of road in uh, Scotland, which is in England, they still call the Todd Road McAdam, um, McAdam after him. In America, it was a Belgian chemist named De Smelt who paved the first roads outside Patterson, New Jersey. And people were absolutely astounded you have no idea what life was like back in those days. Um, roads were a constant problem and America was very weak on developing roads. The thing we call cobblestones today was not a cobblestone at all. A cobblestone was a round rock taken from the river and sunk into the road to hold the dirt in. The first paved road in America was in New York City, it was New Amsterdam then, and it was used to run off the beer, the, the rotten beer from a brewery because the neighbors were complaining about the stink. So they paved the road so the rotten beer would run into the harbor. That was in the 1600s. So when asphalt came, by then they had tried all kinds of things, laying brick, laying sets. Sets are those square cobblestones that you see from time to time and you can buy them at Home Depot. Um, cobblestones or sets were made by the thousands in the winter time by the granite quarry workers. The granite quarry workers making sets of cobblestones that we now call them 
was the highest paid man at the quarry. He made five cents a brick and he could make $18 a day at a time when the average person was making 150 a day. So making uh, granite paving blocks was good. In New York City, in fact, they actually laid wood down on its end to pave the roads because the horse clopping, the horses clopping down the street was driving everybody crazy. When the smelt came up with this asphalt and poured it out on the street, it was so amazing that President Ulysses S. Grant came out and laid the first asphalt in front of the uh, Capitol building. And uh, it was a huge change for people. The problem with asphalt is that when it gets hot out in the summertime, it melts and gets sticky. So aggregates had to be added. And to do that, uh, Frederick Warren and his brother invented bituminous asphalt, which was using oil waste instead of natural asphalt, mixed with sand and concrete and heated to 300 degrees to form the structure that we see on the road. Now, much to Warren's chagrin, he was not able to patent the word bituminous asphalt. It became like Xerox or Kleenex, and everybody used the name and sold whatever formula they wanted to. Uh, no one honors his patent. Everybody uses what they think is right. However, within 10 years of him inventing this, 40 million square feet of asphalt are laid throughout America, which is absolutely meaningless because the first road outside a city wasn't paved till 1908. Okay, that's enough of cool things from Boston. So now what we'll talk about is expensive things to do in Boston that are still wicked fun. This is my very favorite expensive thing to do in Boston. I started with the first one. It's the Old Town Trolley Tours. There are lots of different kinds of tours you can take in Boston, but for my money, nothing beats the Old Town Trolley Tour. It is the best tour in the city. And anybody that comes to Boston and they wanna know what to do to tour the city, I tell them to step right down to the aquarium station and take the Old Town Trolley Tour. Now, it is a little bit expensive. It's $45 a person, but they mix it with other events. Like, for example, you can catch up with the Boston by Foot Tour of uh, Beacon Hill, and they let you off at various places, and you can get on the next bus that comes by for no extra charge. They also have things like ghost tours where they take you around haunted places, like uh, where Edgar Allan Poe was born, or, or where Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler, lived, and so on. So the tours take about 90 minutes. The drivers are really good. I take these tours all the time so that I can learn more things and so that I can ridicule the driver when he says something that's not true, or I can tell him that it's time to talk about something important that, in my opinion, he misses. Now, if I had my druthers and a commercial driver's license, and I wasn't afraid to drive in Boston in a bus, this is the sort of thing I would love to do. Five stars. If you're going to do something in Boston, even if you live here, take the Old Town Trolley Tour. That's comparison to the duck boat tour, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. I give it two stars at both, at most. This is a boat, uh, is a former World War II duck that was used to invade the beaches of Normandy and so on. And um, they have 28 boats and uh, they're all replicas now. The last original one was retired in 2015. And they actually support the state when there are floods and they can go out and rescue people as well. And they're used in parades. And when the Patriots win uh, the Super Bowl or the Boston Red Sox win the World Series, they come down the highway with all the champions on the back and everybody cheers them. And I love seeing this. Now, what they do is they drive around the city a little bit, but not so much because they're very big built vehicles and it's hard to get them around the city. So they're limited as to what they can show you. Then they dive into the water and they travel up to the Longfellow Bridge and then they come back and you get out. Right. OK, so it's forty three dollars for people to do this, which I think is expensive and they're very crowded. And I don't really like the caliber of the tour very much. It's very, very high level. But I suppose if you like going in the water, then this is the sort of thing for you. However. Well, where is it? Oh. I have spoken on other tours of the Galleria boat ride that leaves from Kendall Square Galleria in Cambridge. That's only $12.95. It goes out into the harbor and gives you an architectural tour. And it goes up to Harvard University as well, up the Charles River. And it has a full bar on board. So for $12.95, it is a much, much better tour. So this is no longer available. The federal government has closed down the Boston Light after the last um, hurricane a couple of years ago. 
right before the pandemic. However, I like to keep it in here because I thought this was the absolute best trip anybody could ever take in Boston. You know, you take a boat trip out to the Outer Harbor to Little Brewster Island and meet the only lightkeeper left in America, Sally Snowman, and go up to the top of the oldest lighthouse in America and see the Fresnel light um, sending light out to the ships at sea. However, um, the GSA bought the island, uh, bought the property, but not the island. That remains part of the federal government. But they only allow you to tour around the island now. They are saying that they might allow tours to land on the island, which, by the way, is extremely small. But they're not going to let anybody go up in the tower anymore, which I think is a travesty. So um, it's still a cool thing if you get to go to the island because there's a lot of historical stuff on the island to look at. Segway tours is something that's only recently been added to Boston. I did this last year. I really enjoyed it. If you've never done these segways, they're these gyroscopically controlled machines that don't let you fall over when you drive them. And this is one of the most popular tours in Boston. It leaves from Atlantic Avenue near the Marriott Hotel. You can actually go down there and see signs that say segway tours. The tours take one or two hours. They have an excellent tour guide. They have an excellent set of tour guides that pretty much know anything. They, they really are top-notch guys who can point out anything. And before you start, they give you a little short training course on how to ride this thing. So the good thing about this is that they're much faster than walking. So you can see a lot more stuff. The bad thing about this is they can only go where subways can go. And the worst thing about this is they can be very, very expensive. However, it's really quite an event. You know, you see a lot of Boston. The tour guides are excellent. And they will go with a tour guide, even if only one person shows up which has happened to me more than once. I show up and I'm the only one and they still go out with me. But, you know, it's pretty pricey. So, uh, oh, I think I already did that one. I'm having a tough time with my fingers today. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. There's not really enough that can be said about this museum. It was started in the Copley Square where the Copley Fairmount is located now. And that little picture in the bottom is what it used to look like. Then they tore it down in 1912, about the same time the Titanic sank, and they built a new MFA uh, on Huntington Avenue um, on the Green Line. And they did that in 1907. So the building was designed to be added so that more could be built onto it as they got more um, exhibits. And it really is a very cool one. If you go there, the very first thing you see when you go in is the ancient musical instrument exhibit and you will be astonished by the number of instruments that are in there that not only do they not make anymore but that you probably have never heard of or seen before i was pretty amazed so um 25 is kind of a lot of money to go to the museum so it's a premium thing to do per person but you can get there on the green line trolley uh, from various locations and there's lots of other things to do in the area that you can see, which is pretty cool. For example, you can go to the Colonnade Hotel to their uh, swimming pool on the roof, or you can go to the um, Christian Science Church and see their reflecting pool or go in and see the world's largest pipe organ or go through their world globe. Or you can go to the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum, which is right next door. All in all, if you're going to go to the museum, you're going to spend quite a few hours there looking at the cool art. Here, I did it again. Okay, and so it turns out that the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is the next thing on my list. So Isabella Stewart Gardner was married to a rich arms manufacturer and inherited a fortune. Um, she had a miscarriage and her child died and she was uh, grieved by the death of the child and probably never recovered. But to help her overcome the grief of losing her child, she went around the world and literally raped important artifacts from other nations and brought them back to America. Now, seriously, she brought some of this priceless art back for next to nothing, buying them at distressed sales and so on and so on. She had an art expert who helped her go out and select the various arts. And I got to tell you that it really is awe-inspiring when you go into this museum and you can see Michelangelo's pencil sketches 
of David that he was using to carve that giant statue of David in the Ephesio in Florence. And it, it's just absolutely astonishing. And the eclectic nature of the art is really something to behold. Now, as many of you know, this was the scene of probably the greatest art heist in history. $100 million worth of art, including some priceless Rembrandts, were stolen in 1990. Now, an enormous reward has been offered, no questions asked for the art. But there's a lot of investigation that's been going on. They know who the names of the men who stole the art now, but both of them have died. They dressed up as police officers, and they believed that one of the guards on the inside was helping them. It's also believed that the art was destroyed. After the art was stolen, it was taken up to a barn in Maine and then moved by the Patriarca family down to Connecticut, where it was hidden under a shed and a rainstorm occurred and flooded the gully under the shed and destroyed the paintings. Do we know that for a fact? No, we do not know that for a fact. We don't know really what happened, but this is the information that's been pieced together over time uh, and they coming up with the uh, best possible answer. Godzilla. All right, I'm going to give this two stars at best, one and a half stars if possible. This is provided by Boston Harbor Cruises, and it looks really awesome. So I've done this twice. So this is a 2,800 horsepower, 70 foot aluminum jet boat that goes wicked fast, then it leaves from the aquarium. Here's the problem Boston Harbor is a no wake zone. So for the trip goes out for about an hour. And it goes out at putt, 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 till it gets out into the outer harbor. Then it circles around at high speed for about five minutes. And then it putt, 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 putt back into the harbor. While you're on it, it's really exciting. And you are going to get wet. But it's a lot of money for not much action. So I only give it like two stars. The good thing about it is it leaves from Boston, Long Wharf. And there's lots and lots of other things to do around it. And I always like things that are on the water in Boston. We're so lucky to have the harbor. So this is one of the top attractions that people go to, but I feel it's greatly overrated. This is something that's not grossly overrated. This is the Liberty Clipper Tours of Boston and Northern Lights. This is a fleet of sailing ships that come into Boston Harbor and um, you can take them out on various cruises. They go out every day. They have evening, wine and cheese cruises, they have lunch cruises, they have dinner cruises and so on. If you are looking for a way to actually relax and go slowly through the harbor, this is the thing to do. Because these boats don't go very fast and they don't always raise the sails. They raise the sails, but they don't sail with them. They use a motor, but they will tool all around the harbor and they go over to Charlestown and they go out to Castle Island and then they come back. And it's very relaxing and it's very interesting. Often they have a tour guide from Boston by foot who will tell you what you're looking at in the harbor when you're going out there. And that's really pretty interesting. There's a lot to see in the harbor and it's good to have a tour guide. They do all kinds of singles cruises. So they have like singles wine and cheese things as well. And what happens is, is in the winter time, they leave for Florida and they stop at Baltimore and they will actually take passengers who want to go to Baltimore. It takes about, I don't know, a couple of weeks I actually looked into it. I never really did it. But you can actually go down to Baltimore or even Florida as a passenger on this boat. Let me tell you, though, the accommodations are pretty tight. But I can't imagine uh, a more romantic thing. I actually sailed on a tall ship in 1992, and it was quite an adventure. The cruises start at $38 and up. Uh, booze is extra. I think they include the cheese and crackers for free. So we have two boats in Boston. We have the Spirit of Boston and the Odyssey excursion boats, and they will take you out for dinner. So um, these are provided by Hornblower Cruises, which recently bought Boston Harbor Cruises. Which I have to tell you, it was a major disappointment to me because Boston Harbor Cruises was a family owned operation for many, many years. And I'm hoping Hornblower is gonna continue to be cool about the whole Boston cruise thing. So um, the dinner cruises are the most popular. They can last up to four hours. And they have a band on board usually. They go out, you can have your choice of food and they tool around the harbor. You can go out on the decks and enjoy the um, sun going down over the city. They can have up to 600 people a ship. Um, and here's a cool thing that they don't tell you. The ships almost always sell out. But if you 
go up at the very last minute, if you're the type of person who's into that, you can get a ticket for like $20, which includes all your meal, but not your booze. So um, it's usually $100 per person to go on. But at the very last minute, when they're trying to dump the seats, or if somebody cancels, they'll sell you the seat for like $20. I've done that before. So it, it is possible. My sister actually had her wedding reception on this boat. It was about $10,000. It includes all the foods and open bar and the cake and the flowers. So you can rent this boat for weddings and it goes out into the harbor for four hours. And the good thing about it is when it's over, everybody has to go home and you don't have to do any cleanup. So that part's pretty cool. So I give this about three stars. The reason I only give it three stars is because once you're on the boat, you can't get off. It's not like going to a bar where if you don't like it, you can just get in your car or get on the subway and drive away. Once you're on the boat, you're on the boat till the experience is over. So here's the Boston Tea Party Museum. This is a private museum. It has nothing to do with the city or the state. So as you know, the Boston Tea Party occurred in Boston in 1773. And it didn't happen at the site where these ships are. It happened diagonally opposite at Independence Wharf, which used to be Griffin's Wharf. And I always tell people to go to Independence Wharf because it has an open observation deck on the roof that is free, that you can get a complete view of Boston Harbor and on the other side, the Greenway. So I highly recommend going to Independence Wharf. But if you're really into history and you wanna see the Boston Tea Party, these have the original scale boats. There's three of them. However, only two are there right now. You may have recalled the Beaver was the main boat that was used, but the Elder and the Dartmouth were the two other ships. The interesting thing about this is that the tea on board the ships was owned by a man named John Rowe, who was one of the men who agreed to throw the tea over dressed as an Indian. He sacrificed his money for the sake of liberty. And now we have Rowe's Wharf, which is named after him. Now, it turns out that in 1976, the Queen of England came to America for our bicentennial and went up to the old state house. And the mayor of Boston presented her with a check for $50,000, which was the cost of the tea back in 1773. However, that would be worth $2 million today. It's going to give a $2 million check to the Queen of England. So these ships are there. They're, this is the type of ship that would cross the Atlantic Ocean loaded with tea back in those days. And you can see they're really pretty small. In fact, if you go to the tour, they will tell you these were the 18 wheelers of their day. So these things were plying back and forth across the Atlantic all the time. The museum also has a full restaurant and bar and they like to serve tea. Um, it's very expensive, $30 per person. And the tour is very long. They use a lot of holographic techniques, to try to keep your interest. And they're very good with the history and they have the last or the only original tea chest from the Boston Tea Party as the ju crown jewel of their tour. So if you have squirmy kids, this is probably not the tour for you. Bodeborg. Bodeborg is an escape room started in Sweden in 1995. It's in seven countries. Um, the adventurers are called guests here and it requires both mental and physical agility. This is not just like a typical escape room where you solve puzzles. You actually have to crawl through tunnels and up ropes and sorts of things like that. It requires at least three people in a group to go. Um, you need to be in rather good physical condition to take advantage of this adventure. And you can see it could be like in the 20 to $30 a person range, which is kind of expensive, but not outlandishly so. F1 racing, I've done this a couple of times myself and this can be really exciting. This is in Braintree. You have little F1 like go-karts that go up to 40 miles an hour and you race around the track and you can race against your friends or against strangers. And they do a little training before you go in there. It's $40 a person. And you can rent this entire uh, facility for your organization and do it as a team building exercise or a bachelor party. Uh, sort of thing. It's kind of hard to find. It's at 290 Wood Road in the Blue Hills uh, outside Braintree and Quincy, but it, it's really fun. It's a lot of fun to do. And the interesting thing about it is they have a flag man. And if you're going too slow, they will flag you off the track. So they really expect you to keep your speed up because it's just as dangerous to go 
too slow as it is to go too fast. So the New England Aquarium is a central point of interest for many people that come to Boston. Started in the 1960s, it has a lot of visitors, over a million visitors a year. It's one of the largest viewing tanks in the world. It is part of a complex that includes the IMAX cinema, which I talked about in a previous presentation. It also sponsors the whale watches. The cool thing about this is it's right on the blue line. So you can get there from the subway. You don't have to worry so much about parking, for example, Outside the city, you can park at Alewife or Quincy Adams Station in Quincy and take the train in and then spend a day here. It has a parking garage. It's the most expensive parking garage in the city, $75 a day to park. Everybody hates parking there, but have no fear. They're going to tear it down and put a 600-foot skyscraper there, which I have been railing against for years. This aquarium was featured in the movie Next Stop Wonderland, which was filmed entirely in Boston with some tier B stars. I love the movie. It has a great line in it, which I've never forgotten, about two people getting together and falling in love. And the line is, the magic isn't in what gets you together. The magic is in what keeps you together. So if you like a quirky movie that's shot in Boston, I highly recommend Next Stop Wonderland. They tried to move to Boston to uh, the Charlestown Navy Yard, which would have made great sense in the 1990s, but they went bankrupt instead and they were unable to do the move. So they had to stay in place and reorganize their finances and the tickets are $32 a piece. The Whale Watch, this is definitely one of the best things in Boston that you can do. It includes so many things, including a boat out into deep, way off the coast of, uh, of Boston. They have whale experts on the boat. It's a very, very long boat ride. Bring your bonine, bring your anti-seasickness bracelets, um, don't take Gramamine, you'll fall asleep. Um, but, you know, you've got to plan on doing this. It's going to be four hours. So it's going to be a pretty much a day trip for you to go out and do the whale watch. It's $55 and they have other little fees in there. And it leaves from the aquarium. Um, they are extremely popular. You are not guaranteed to see whales. In the years, recent years, they've seen more whales than they expected. And when you do see them, it's really quite an amazing thing. So this is highly recommended for anybody. Again, I love anything that takes place on the water. Boston Harbor is just so incredibly awesome that everybody should go there. The Franklin Park Zoo is an interesting place for many, many reasons. So this opened in 1912. It was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed the emerald necklace that goes around Boston for which the Green Line is named. And he also designed Central Park in New York City. This is located on Columbia Road in Dorchester and includes a public golf course. They have about 2 million visitors a year now, thanks to the efforts of a, a dedicated group of people. The, um, when the museum opened up, when the park, when the zoo opened up in 1912, it was immediately popular. And it was popular until the 1950s when the Dorchester area fell into becoming a very dangerous, dangerous ghetto. In fact, they were actually going to close the Franklin Park Zoo and sell it off to developers in the 1980s because only about 30,000 people a year were going there. So in addition, this park was crippled by the Stone Zoo. Now, Massachusetts is really not big enough to support two zoos, but because of the different political factions in Massachusetts, the Stone Zoo is financed at the expense of the Franklin Park Zoo. Nevertheless, philanthropists gathered together to save the zoo, and they get you know, many visitors a year. And they have lots of shows. During the COVID, they had a drive-through light show, which was really pretty interesting. And they have a butterfly pavilion, which is pretty excellent. It's only $11 to get in. Eh, not too expensive if you have family. The Omni Science Museum, uh, the Science Museum at the Mugar Omni Theater is one of my favorite places to go. And I really like to go because I love to see the Tesla coil, which you see here in this drawing when they do the lightning making exhibition. And they also have a planetarium where they do laser light shows. Started as the Boston Society of Natural History by a bunch of educated men. And it had a building, one of the first buildings built in the back bay when it was filled in. Uh, later, that building actually broke in half when the land under it settled improperly and they moved to their current location in 1951. So. Um, this has the Hayden Planetarium, which has an excellent Pink Floyd laser light show, 
which I can't recommend enough and I've seen many, many times. If you like Pink Floyd, that's the way to go. So um, you can take the subway to here at Leachmere Station. They're doing a lot of construction work in that area. So you have to check to see if the trains are running and they'll also have buses. And uh, they have a very large audience, but the truth is, is that the museum is geared more towards children than towards adults. There are lots of interactive exhibits for children to interest them in science. However, if you like science as well, you can delve deeper and you can see some of the many exhibits and they have an excellent gift shop with all kinds of cool stuff. It's pretty expensive and the parking is also extra. You can't forget it when you go there. So $29 to get in plus the parking is pretty pricey. However, I give it a good three and a half, four stars for adventure. One of my favorite things to do is to fast ferry to Provincetown. Let's not even talk about getting to Provincetown in the first place, where there's also always a million things to do. Just taking this fast boat from Boston is pretty awesome. 120 miles from Boston only takes 90 minutes by ferry. You know, you get on the first ferry in the morning, you go down to Provincetown, you have a great time. You get back on the ferry, you get back in time to have dinner in town. It's awesome. The ferry is really comfortable. They have TVs on board. They have a complete snack bar. They have room for strollers and bikes. And uh, they have tables so you can sit down. And it, it's really quite the thing. I highly recommend that if you have people coming to Boston and they want to spend a day on Cape Cod, this is the easiest, most trouble-free, painless way to spend a day on Cape Cod and at Provincetown, which is really an excellent place to go anyway. So um, there is another ferry, which is pretty slow. It takes four hours. I don't recommend it. You can get seasick on it. It hits the waves. It's pretty uncomfortable. I've done it a few times and I don't recommend it. So you can also take boats from Woods Hole and Martha, into, to Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Um, Martha's Vineyard is really pretty inexpensive, but Nantucket is ridiculous to go to. Way too expensive, I think. So another ferry that I like is the ferry to Salem. Salem is another ancient town in Massachusetts where the first millionaire in America comes from. His name was Derby. Um, we have a ferry that goes up to Salem and lands you with an easy walking distance of all the um, historical sites to see in the town. Now I've gone up there twice on Halloween and let me tell you, it's really insane. And you can wear costumes and in fact, it's encouraged, but you can't carry anything in your hand. The police will take it from you. So if you bring fake swords or fake guns or staffs or things like that, they don't want any of that stuff in there because there can be a lot of unhappiness. So if you go up there in your costume, don't bring crap in your hands. The, fer the ferry takes about an hour. It's $45 round trip, which is a little bit expensive, but when you include parking, if you drive up there and all the hassle of traffic on 128, then this is really quite convenient. And you can go to the Peabody Essex Museum which is probably the greatest underrated museum in New England um, and uh, highly recommend. So if you like boat trips, if you like the adventure of being on the sea and going to a historical location and seeing the witches and so on, then this is the thing for you. I do it at least once a year just for the adventure of being on the boat. And I like, to be honest with you, I like going to the boat more than I like going to Salem. Symphony Hall is a hidden jewel in Boston that we are so lucky to have. It was built in 1900 by McKim, Mead and White. They also built the Boston Public Library about 20 years earlier. The acoustics were designed by a has-been physics professor named Wallace Sabine, who was thrown a bone and told to go off and do the acoustics for this symphony hall. And he went and did some scientific research and designed it so that he could get the best sound. And as a result, it is now considered the best musical venue in the entire world. Then the second place finisher is in Vienna, Austria. So people and uh, uh, orchestras really enjoy playing in Symphony Hall. It's quite the thing for them to do. It holds about 2,700 people. They can take all the chairs out in the orchestra and put tables. And at Christmas time, when the pops play there, this is what they do. I've gone there a couple of times. You sit in the orchestra pit. They bring you booze and you get to watch the Christmas songs. It's really pretty nice. So various groups use the symphony hall to play music. 
It's also located on Huntington Avenue near the Boston uh, Christian Science Church and the Museum of Fine Arts. So there's a lot of things that you can do in that area. There is parking nearby. It's not cheap and it's not extraordinarily plentiful. So taking the subway is probably the best way to go. It's really expensive to get tickets, but they do have rush seats, very limited for $9. And the people who know about it wait in very long lines to get those rush seats um, because seeing an orchestra play at Symphony Hall is a lifetime experience that people who love music will always remember. So Symphony Hall is, uh, it's a jewel of Boston. It's probably one of the five greatest things in the city, in my opinion. The Berkeley Performance Center is also pretty interesting. And uh, this started at the Schillinger, Schillinger House um, and changed it to, uh, Schillinger changed it to Berkeley after connecting the names of his sons. So what happened was, this was kind of a failing jazz place that exploded into popularity after World War II when the soldiers came back from Europe who were exposed to music in Europe and were looking for a place to learn it and see it as well. It's the largest college of contemporary music in the world. They offer their own doctorate, which is conferred by Harvard, so that's really prestigious. And they have their own club where you can see um, underappreciated and experimental artists. I've seen a couple there, and I'm going to tell you, when they say experimental, they mean experimental. I did not enjoy it. However, I could appreciate the awesomeness of the venue and the opportunity to do it. So. Tickets range from $30 and up, and you can see somebody who in a couple of years, you can say, I saw that guy at Berkeley Performance Center. And there are still some, up until the past 10 years, there were still some really famous names that would play there from time to time. I think I once saw Buddy Rich there in the 1980s. So this is an interesting thing. This is the Cape Flyer train to Hyannis. It's only offered in the summer. It's $40 round trip, and what it does is it takes the train from South Station all the way to Hyannis, where they have buses that will take you to the beach, or you can bring your bike on the train, and then you can bike around. So the ride takes about two hours, which is about the same as if you took the car and there was no traffic. So there's a meal car on board or a cafe car, so you can sit around and eat bagels and drink Coke or beer and talk to your friends. They have Wi-Fi. And you don't have to worry about driving or parking. So one of the coolest things about this trip is it goes over the Cape Cod Canal using the drawbridge, which is still there down near uh, the Bourne Bridge. So that alone for me is a selling point for the train. And I'm a big train guy anyway. But um, I do have to say that two hours on a train is a long time. But if you have your book, if you like to go with your friends, if you like to relax without driving, and see some cool things, then taking the flyer is an interesting alternative to driving down Route 3, which, believe me, is no joy anytime. So we also have the Institute of Contemporary Art. It's broken into two locations. One is in East Boston, near Pierce Park, and the other is in South Boston on the Fan Pier. Started at the Museum of Modern Art. It displayed art that did not get joy from other museums. And some of the people who were displayed there who, who were not appreciated in their day included Salvador Dali and Edward Munch, Andy Walhall, Robert Maplethorpe. And they opened up this building with the Shepherd Fairy Hope Collection at the time of Obama's election. Uh, by some quirk of fate, I was invited to the premiere of the Shepherd Fairy um, exhibition. And I have to say, it was really, really impressive. This is a great place to see art. Um, this place has moved many times because it has not got much love throughout the city of Boston. And when they did open up, they had cliff diving from the roof into the harbor. And back in those days, the harbor was pretty dirty. So that was pretty adventurous of them. I haven't seen it in a few years, but if they ever do it again, it's well worth viewing to see people jumping off the roof into the harbor. It's $15 to get in. It is, uh, that's which is not too expensive. And the one on East Boston is nowhere near as good but it's near KO Pies, which is a great place to get Australian paste, meat pasties, although it's changed hands recently. I don't know if it's still as good. 
since it changed hands, but it's also near the Nantucket Lightship in Pierce Park. And I have to say that the ICA in East Boston is the absolute number one best place in the city to watch fireworks over the harbor. Can't recommend it enough. If there were more than five stars, I would give it more than five stars. The next time they do fireworks in Boston, get on the train, blue line, go to Maverick, get off, walk to Pierce Park, visit the museum, visit the light ship, have a KO pie, and watch the fireworks. It's just phenomenal. Okay, so there's all kinds of theaters in Boston. I'm not going to belabor this point too much, as you can see. There are all kinds of theaters, and many of them are famous, like the Orpheum Theater and the House of Blues. The Schubert's quite famous. The Wilbur's quite famous. We talked about the Colonial. Um, these are all pretty expensive venues. However, you can see pretty cool things. The Opera House was a smut theater that has been completely restored into its glory. If you have a chance to go, I suggest you put on your evening gown and your tuxedo, valet park your car at the Ritz Hotel, which you can see in the background of this picture with the blue lights and walk up there and feel like you're a millionaire because once you walk into the lobby, you'll think you're a millionaire. So one of my favorite things in Boston is the Blue Man Group and Sheer Madness. This group started in 1987 as street performance arts and they took over the upstairs of the Charles Street Playhouse and they were so successful that they bought the entire building. And upstairs they do, um, Share Madness, which is a comedy play where the audience determines the ending. And the downstairs is the Blue Man Group. I had a friend who proposed to his wife at the Blue Man Group using their display, their joke display uh, mechanism in front of the stage, which was quite amusing to see. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the denouement or the conclusion of their program is, but let's suffice it to say that it was one of the most hilarious and exciting things I've ever seen in my life. If you've never been to the Blue Man Group, it's well worth the $58 to go once. So good, in fact, that Cirque du Soleil bought them. Cirque du Soleil is without a doubt the best circus organization in the entire world. When the first time I went to Cirque du Soleil was in Las Vegas. The tickets were $120 a piece. I felt like I was getting ripped off. When the show was over, I went up to the booth because I wanted to give them another hundred dollars. That's how good it was. Obviously I didn't give them the money, but it was so good. I felt like I owed them money. So for them to buy the Blue Man Group indicates the caliber of entertainment that these people are delivering. And it really is excellent. And I give it five stars. Here is a hidden secret of Boston is the Boston Athenaeum. This is a, the oldest private library in America. It's on top of Beacon Hill. It's quite hidden. There are 200,000 books and artifacts. It is the biggest Civil War library in America. They open up the library once a year to the general public. But if you are a member, which is quite expensive to join, then you can get the opportunity to look at some of their old works. They even have a Gutenberg Bible there. So this is not part of the Odd Volumes Club. The Odd Volumes Club is another Boston organization that only has like 40 members it only recently allowed women to join and nobody else can go and visit them. And they keep uh, rare and old books that are um, not a collection. That's why they're called on volumes. Boston by Foot is probably the best tour organization in Boston, if not America. So what it is that they're located on Beacon Hill. They have their own house, which is pretty awesome. I've been in it many times. And they provide 20 different walking tours of the city. They last about 90 minutes. And the tours are focused on the architecture more than the history, although they do tell interesting sto stories. They, the tours prices range from 10 to $30. They hope you will tip the tour guide when it's over. That's how they make their money. Um, there is so much history in Boston that I can't even begin to scratch. And they know absolutely everything. I was a member for a while. I could not keep up with it. They make you memorize so many facts and figures. You have to take tests. You have to write essays. You have to write documents and do original research to be a tour guide there. And they are quite an excellent organization. Um, you can find them in downtown Boston, usually in the common. 
and take and sign up for one of their tours if you get the opportunity to do it i highly 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 recommend it you will not get a better more informed tour in the city of boston than the boston by foot tour and that's all i have to say and robert i finished a little bit early um, thank you very much, my friends, for having given me the opportunity to do this. There is one more presentation left in this series, which is fun things to do within an hour of Boston. And uh, perhaps we'll get an opportunity to do it. But if you have any comments or questions or complaints, or you want to add something that I missed, please feel free to send me a message now. <laughs> I think we have been abandoned by Robert. I'm here, Jay. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Technical no. difficulties. Uh, no, one second. No so How folks, you doing, man? How's everybody doing? Oh, I unmuted. I, okay. uh, if anyone has any questions for Jay, uh, please get them into the q and Okay, Jay, I'm using a, so I'm at home and I'm using a different laptop than I usually use. So okay. um, be patient with me here. Oh, no all problem right. at all. Uh, Karen says, what a great talk. Can't wait to go to Boston next to do one of these tours. Uh, Shannon says, thank you. Um, let's see if I can scroll up. Julia says, thank you. Very good, very interesting. Mike says, another great presentation. Thank you. Let's see, I'm going to slowly scroll down. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, are there any high-rise observation decks that Jay would recommend? Yes, yes, there are. I would recommend two. And one of them, if you look at this last picture of my presentation, one of them is at Independence Wharf, which is the building that is second from the left with that little green um, awning on the left-hand side. That's Independence Wharf. You can go up there, 14 stories. It's absolutely free. It's part of the Greenway. Um, it's open Monday through Sunday, but it closes at 5 o'clock. It gives an awesome view of the city. Very well worth going to see that. Um, the other one is the Custom House Tower, which you see in the upper right with the uh, clocks on it. They have shut down their tours because of the COVID. But if you call up, they will give you a time when you can come up. It is the highest outside observation deck in the city. It is absolutely phenomenal and it's free. So call up the Marriott Courtyard, ask them when they're available to make an appointment and they will let you go up to there. And they have a TV camera that looks at the hawks ripping squirrels apart to feed their babies. They have peregrine falcons up there, which are the fastest animals on earth. It's really very cool. The Prudential is closed down forever. The Hancock is closed down forever. There are some secret places you can go. One, a couple of the secret places that I like to go is, for example, the top of the aquarium parking garage and other high-rise parking garages, which are not really um, observation decks, but you can go there and, and, and have good views. There's a, there, there's a creative idea. <laughs> go to the top of the parking garages. I like that. It's uh, free, too. Oh, one more. Me. If you go to Mount Auburn Cemetery, Mount Washington Observatory has the highest observation deck of Boston from west of the city, and it's free. All right. Uh, Diana says this was most interesting, and she thanks you a lot. Uh, any other comments or questions for Jay? And as Jay said, he does have one more presentation. It's about things to do within an hour of Boston. So... I'm sure I will uh, book that for the summer at some point. Um, but not seeing any further comments or questions, I think we'll wrap it up, Jay. Uh, thanks for staying on time for me, I appreciate it. And um, I want to again thank the Ashland Library and the uh, Friends of the Tewksbury Library for uh, co-sponsoring and uh, helping promote today's program. So thank you all so much. Look for that email from me tomorrow with a feedback survey and with the recording. Thanks again. Thanks, Jay. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the opportunity. Absolutely. This may take me a good 30 seconds to shut this down. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, my mouse doesn't want to... Uh...
work here. Okay. All right. I think I got it. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.